So my goal here, my job is to take a breath with you and give you a little bit of context for why we're here these next three days. Uh, the context is not only what's going on in medicine, but what's going on around the world that's driving all of our industries, that's driving all the changes that uh, are really picking up the pace of life. I'm going to start by making the statement that I stand here today fundamentally believing that we're heading into the next two or three decades into a time where we're going to be able to address and solve all of humanity's grand challenges. I think that the power and the technology coming online is so extraordinary, so unfathomable, that uh, it's going to change the very fabric of society and change the way that we practice not only medicine, but everything. So as I sit here and talk about creating a world of abundance, creating a world in which we're gonna meet the, the basic needs of every man, woman, and child, the challenge is that all of us hear this information, but we hear it with the hardware and wetware of our brains that evolved on the savannas of Africa hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago. Now, those of you who are physicians, those of you in the medical field, understand that we evolved in, in reaction to the environment we were in. And so the way we think, the very fundamental fabric of the way we're wired, was a result of the fact that we lived and evolved in a time back then that was local and linear. When I say it was local and linear, what I mean by local is that everything that affected you was within a day's walk. Something happened on the other side of the planet, unless it was an asteroid strike, you knew nothing about it. It was linear in that the life of your great-grandparents, you, your kids, their kids, generation to generation, millennium to millennium, nothing changed. And that's the way we think. And so we have developed fundamental cognitive biases that make us think in a local and linear fashion. But today, the world isn't but that, right? Today, the world is global and exponential. Something happens in China, India, you know about it seconds later. Your computers know about it microseconds later. Not only do things change millennium to millennium, century to century, decade to decade, they are changing year to year. And so if I were to graph that, this is what we see, and this is what we're talking about here at FutureMed and at Singularity University. That red line, it's us. It's our politicians, it's our cohorts, it's our patients, it's our employees, it's all of us. None of us, I don't think, have had a sort of a hardware or software upgrade, you know, since birth. That yellow line is the technology we're creating, right? It's the exponential technologies that we teach and we think about here at Singularity Universities. AI, robotics, synthetic biology, digital medicine. It's the power of technology doubling year on year. And the difference between the way we're thinking and this rapid rate of growth is disruptive, opportunity or disruptive stress, depending on your point of view. If you're the CEO of a public company that's got quarterly returns and you're worried about making those returns and then some upstart kid in the garage comes up with a product that disrupts your business, that's disruptive stress. If you're the entrepreneur who came up with the idea, that's a disruptive opportunity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, gorge on this mammoth linear company out there and, and eat their lunch. So. There's no better example, and I like using this because we all know it and feel it, than Kodak. You know, Kodak, back in 1996, was a 100-year-old, $28 billion, 140,000-person company. And this company was really the mainstay of the Dow. Everyone around the world knew who Kodak was and used their, their film. And do you know that 20 years earlier, in 1976, they had come up with the digital camera. They had invented it, they owned the patents, they owned the concept, they understood where it was going. But that first digital camera was a toy. And it was 0 .01 megapixels, with the size of a toaster. And you can imagine the conversation that the inventor of the digital camera at Kodak had with the board of directors. No, no, really, really, this is the future of Kodak. And the, you know, the chairman of the board is probably saying, it's a toy for kids, we're Kodak. We make beautiful high resolution images. You know, this thing, and besides, we're in the chemicals and paper business. And of course, not heeding where this technology was going, this 0 0.01 megapixel camera doubled in power year on year until last year Kodak goes bankrupt. 
put out of business by the very technology that they invented themselves. And in the same year, 2012, another company comes online also in the imagery business and gets sold to Facebook, their name is Instagram, for a billion dollars with 13 employees. And that difference between a linear thinking company like Kodak and an exponential one like Instagram is our future. It's going to transform everything going on. We're going to see this over and over again in medicine where really a young upstart company comes online and disrupts billion dollar companies. And I think about this, and I've spoken about this at, future, at past Future Meds where I talk about the notion that if you're a large billion dollar company that is you know, following the FDA regulations and some startup comes out that says, you know, that, that's ridiculous. We're going to go and offer this for free so we don't have to deal with the FDA, whatever the case might be. We're not going to sell it. We're going to give it away. What are you going to do? Because that kind of disruption is going to happen over and over again, especially in this field. Because if any field is going to be massively disrupted this decade, it's medicine. With a second close follow-up is, is the educational and learning space. And I've given this a name where we have an exponential technology disrupting a linear company. I call it the new Kodak moment. Thank you for laughing. So here are the numbers. The numbers. In the next 10 years, 40% of the Fortune 500 companies will no longer exist. Put a different way, this is from Professor Foster at Yale. If you started a company in the 1920s, you had a 67 year story. You could go and milk that for 67 years, your lifetime. But today, if you start a company, your average lifetime on the S&P is 15 years before you're disrupted, displaced, put out of business, acquired, whatever the case might be. The one rule is change. So we study this here at Singularity University. You're going to be hearing a lot more from my colleague, Salim Ismail, who I'll be introducing in a moment. But Ray Kurzweil and I started SU for the simple reason that the educational paradigm for the last 20 years, I'm sorry, last 20, the last 200 years, has been you go and you get your PhD, your medical degree, whatever it might be, and you become so narrowly focused, right? You become the world's expert on an ion channel, in a particular neuron in a particular insect, but you're the world's expert on that. And you need a, you know, you need a PhD to understand someone's PhD doctoral thesis title, let alone their work. There was no place you could go to get a really an overview. Where's it all going? Where's it all coming together? Where's AI and robotics and synthetic biology and digital medicine and 3D printing and computers and networks and sensors? Where's that all going? Where's the overlap? And that's why we created SU. That's why Daniel and Robin and the team here created FutureMed with a focus on medicine. And so at SU, we focus on educating executives. We have uh, amazing executive programs. And then we also focus on the top graduate students. We have a number of medical students here. I welcome you all. And for the medical students or for the students during the, come during the summer, we spend five weeks teaching you about all the exponential technologies, and then we focus on what are the world's biggest problems? What are the grand challenges? You know, because today, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest market opportunities. It's a beautiful alignment. You want to become a billionaire? Solve a problem that affects a billion people. And we actually, in the last five weeks of our graduate program, we ask our students, go out there and start a company, a product or service that can impact the lives of a billion people. That's their metric of success. We call this 10 to the 9th plus impact. And so at SU, at FutureMed, what you're going to be hearing here is basically how all of these exponential technologies, computers, networks, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, 3D printing, digital medicine, how these impact your field. In this case, medicine. But we also talk about how all of these crowd and community tools, incentive competitions, data mining, you know, crowdfunding. How do these tools, which are extraordinarily available today, allow you to do your work in a brand new way, more efficient, faster, with better impact? So I want to take a moment today to make an announcement uh, that we're very excited about. See, we have had the, pl the pleasure 
uh, through our exponential, uh, through our executive programs and through our innovation partner programs to really work with the top innovators around the planet. Uh, we have uh, uh, some of the uh, top Fortune 100 companies, Coca-Cola, Dow, Google, Shell, Cisco, that bring their top executives to our innovation partners program. You'll hear more about that from Salim. And what we found is that every industry is being massively impacted by these exponential technologies. So we've decided, based on the amazing work that Daniel has done, uh, to take this format conference of a three-day program where we look at a particular industry from all these exponential technologies and to launch a series of exponential conferences. Uh, the conference here that you're coming today is FutureMed next year will be renamed to Exponential Medicine. We still have the pleasure of Dr. Daniel Kraft as our MC and visionary, but we're gonna be adding to Exponential Medicine as next year's conference, so you'll be hearing it be referred to sometimes as Future Med this year, but going forward as, Expon as Exponential Medicine Conference. We'll be adding a conference this uh, coming summer on Exponential Finance, the impact of exponential technologies on finance, and then Exponential Manufacturing, and then we may add a couple of others. But I just want to make this announcement here for you today to see, and you're going to feel the format here today repeated in these other conferences going forward. So very proud of that. Uh, Will Weissman and the team who are running this uh, can answer more questions about that. And of course, you'll hear about it from our CEO, Rob Nell. So what does exponential feel like? Because remember, I said we're linear thinkers. And if I ask you to you know, take a set of linear steps, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and 30 steps, you're 30 meters away, and all of you, you're wired to think this way. But if I asked you, take 30 exponential steps, you know, 30 doublings, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, unless you've got it memorized, very few of us understand that in 30 doublings, we will be a billion meters away. Put differently, we will have gone around the planet, you know, 26 times. And that disconnect between sort of linear, I'm going to be there, and oh my God, I'm 26 times around the planet, is what put Kodak out of business. And I want you to imagine in your own practice of medicine what that's going to look like. Because we're going to be seeing this over and over and over again as you see all these amazing speakers that the team has put together talk about how they're going to be using exponential technologies. So, as your introduction, I've created a framework I want to share with you. I call it the six D's of exponentials. And it's a sort of a structure for you to think about where exponential technologies takes you. First of all, anything that becomes digitized, becomes an information technology, hops on exponentials. So the first D, and we're going to talk about these each um, in sequence, is digitization. And when, when something becomes digitized, it enters a very slow, initial, deceptive, growth phase, and then it enters a disruptive growth phase, enters a dematerialization, a demonetization, and finally a democratization. So what do these mean? Let me break this down for you. So when I talk about deceptive and disruptive, it's the following. We, so here's a linear growth path. You saw this before. It's again the way that we think. But if I were to say to you, listen, I'm going to take that 0 .01 megapixel camera that Kodak came up with. And I'm going to double that, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.04. In the early days of exponential doublings of small numbers, it looks like a straight line. And we humans, we, because we're linear thinkers, we force things into linear projections. But when you hit the knee of the curve, all of a sudden it explodes into a disruptive period, period of growth. So you're going to see this over and over again. For example, 3D printing. You'll be hearing about digital manufacturing, 3D printing. 3D printing has been around for 30 years. We just haven't heard about it. But it's been this deceptive phase, and now it's the knee of the curve. You're going to start to see 3D printing exploding onto the scene in these next few years, really impacting a $10 trillion manufacturing industry. Let's talk about dematerialization. So when something enters this disruptive phase, it starts to dematerialize products and services. What does that mean? It means that 20 years later, all of these things fit in your pocket. Right? I don't carry a GPS anymore. It's on my phone. I don't have a flashlight. It's de 
materialized onto my phone, as is my record collection, my toy collection, whatever it might be, these things have now become dematerialized physically onto your phone. So the question is, if you are building a product or a service, how might that product or service become dematerialized? Because once it becomes dematerialized, it then becomes demonetized. Things become pretty much free. So demonetization is the next impact of exponential technologies. iTunes demonetized the record store, right? Skype, I don't pay for long distance phone calls. I use Skype now. Amazon demonetized the bookstore. Google, research and libraries. eBay, the local store. And you know, Craigslist decimated the newspapers. It took the money out of the classifieds, put it back in the consumer's pocket. So this is the process of demonetization. And the final D is democratization. You heard about all of these things in part from Daniel. So we have a billion handsets, a billion handsets in Africa by 2016. So if you're an entrepreneur who starts something that's a digitized product or service, I can now sell it to a billion people in Africa, let alone the rest of the world. So all of this is made possible by this curve. You will absolutely see this 100 times at any Singularity University conference. So this is the power of computation that you could buy with a $1,000 investment. So on the left-hand axis here, we have a log scale. We have how much computational power could $1,000 buy you in one of these years. And on the bottom, we have the 110 years, from 1900 to 2010. What I want you to look at here is the following. On this curve, remember, an exponential growth on a log curve, on a log scale is what? It's a straight line, right? Back to your high school math, junior high school. Um, but it's not a straight line, it's curving upwards. It's the notion that we're building faster computers that are building faster computers, and the second derivative here is positive. The rate at which computers, computers are getting faster is itself getting faster. And on this curve, you don't see World War I or World War II or the recession or the depression. It's independent of what's going on. And if you look at that and you extend it, this is what we see for the next 50 years or so. So the computer driving this presentation is using an Intel processor circa 2010 that's calculating at 100 billion calculations per second, 10 to 11 cycles per second. 10 years from now, $1,000 is gonna buy you a computer calculating at 10 to the 16th cycles per second, which is just a number unless you talk to one of your colleagues over here who's a neurophysiologist who tells you that's the rate at which the, you know, the visual and auditory cortex of the brain does pattern recognition. So what happens when a $1,000 investment can give you the processing power of the human brain? And of course, it doesn't stop there because 25 years later, now the average $1,000 investment is buying you the processing power of the entire human race. Now it gets interesting. Now your kid's homework gets really easy. So we're gonna be seeing this over and over again applied to a multitude of different fields. Uh, I love some of these covers, which we happen to ignore. We ignore a lot of the positive news covers. I'll speak about that in, in a moment. We pay attention to, to the negative news covers, but you know, some of the, the fields going on, print me a Stradivarius, you know, the whole field of cortical implants and optogenetics, plugging in the internet to the human brain where you know, Google on the brain is not a disease, it's an app. And the whole field of AI, which we'll hear from, uh, from Neil Jacobstein speaking about this. But these are the fields driving us forward. So a few critical insights, and just contextual here, right? The only constant is change. And the rate of change is increasing. Really important. I have a couple of conclusions I want to share with you. You are either disrupting your own company or someone else's. Fundamentally, disruption is going to be the norm. You're either Kodak being disrupted or you're the company disrupting yourself. So where inside of your companies, inside of your organizations, your hospitals, your institutions, whatever it might be, are you figuring out how should we disrupt ourselves? How do we reinvent ourselves? Because if you don't, you're gonna be one of the companies that has you know, less than a 15 year lifespan in this next decade. The second thing I wanna point out 
is that if you're dependent on innovation inside your organization, it's not going to work. We're living in a hyper-connected world today where no matter who you are, you know, my friend Bill Joy, who was the chief scientist at Sun and at Kleiner Perkins, has a very famous quote. He says, you know, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people in the world work for someone else. So if you're Larry Page with 50,000 employees in a world of billions of connected people, believe me, the smartest people work for someone else. So how do you tap in to the cognitive genius? And we're going to talk about here during this conference, how do you tap into, you know, data mining? How do you tap into the crowd? How do you tap into all of these things to help you become innovative? So where are you going to do this? You know, my other background besides being the, uh, the executive chairman and co-founder of Singularity University is I serve as the, the CEO and chairman of the XPRIZE, which is one way that we do this. We run large-scale global competitions to crowdsource solutions for areas that are stuck. So I'm going to close my last few minutes uh, on this concept of abundance because I believe that we're heading towards a world which is extraordinary, a world where we're going to be able to meet the basic needs of every man, woman, and child on this planet. And you know, I wrote this book and talked about the fact that we're heading towards this world of abundance and the conversion of medicine from something that is scarce and affordable only to a few to one where it's abundant and available to everyone is something I believe is going to be happening. But before I go there, let me just mention that as I go and I talk about abundance, there's a problem in this context. The problem is that when I go and I speak about it, a lot of people say to me, you know, Peter, you're being very naive here. You know, have you heard about the school shootings here? And have you heard about the statistics here and the economic ruin in Europe? How can you say we're heading towards a world of abundance? And I want to share with you a notion that especially as, as physicians and people in the medical field, we need to understand, which is we're living in a day and age where the news media is a drug pusher and negative news is their drug. And in every device that you have, night and day, on your cell phone, on your tablet, on your television, your radio, your newspaper, you're being fed negative news 24 hours a day, 10 to 1 over positive news. And there's a reason for this. It's not just that they're masochists and they like to do this. They want your attention. And as we were evolving on the savannas of Africa hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, if you missed a piece of good news, like there's some food over there, that's too bad. You missed a piece of bad news, like you know, the rustle in the leaves was a tiger, and you were out of the gene pool. You were lunch. And so as you know, we evolved an ancient piece of our temporal lobe called the amygdala. And the amygdala scans everything you see and everything you hear looking for negative news. And if it sees you, you have a physiological response. You go online in a massive way, you get, you know, you're, you're literally turned on and your, your nervous system is acutely aware of what's going on. And for this reason, the news media feeds us negative news. And so do our politicians. So open up any newspaper today and look at the number of stories positive to negative. The question you have to ask yourself, is that really the way the world is? Is it really going to hell in the handbasket? And if you look at the last hundred years, to give you some perspective, we've had an extraordinary hundred years of progress. Over the last hundred years, as you well know, the average human lifespan has more than doubled. The per capita income for every nation on this planet has more than tripled. Maternal mortality rates, childhood mortality rates have plummeted orders of magnitude. This is a cover from June Economist, towards the end of poverty, right? We've taken almost a billion and a half people out of extreme poverty. My friend Steven Pinker at Harvard wrote this book that says, we are living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. I mean, but would you ever know that watching CNN? No, because their job is to take every warfare, every murder on the planet and bring it to you live in living color over and over and over again in HD. And when I get a text on my CNN news alert that some kid is found guilty of murdering his parents, I mean, really, is that global news? Do I need to know about that? Or is that simply making us that much more anxious about what's going on? 
Think about that, please. Because your chance of dying a violent death is one five hundredth of what it used to be. Technology, ladies and gentlemen, is what's making this change. The reason that the world has gotten that much better, that the cost of food has dropped 13-fold, the cost of energy has dropped 20-fold, the cost of transportation 100-fold, the cost of communications over 1,000-fold. All of these things have been made possible by technology. It's not that we live in a, a time where we're smarter or that politicians are better. It's the impact of the exponential technologies that we teach here. And for that reason, the rate of change, the rate of impact is going to create, it's going to continue. So technology is that which takes what was scarce and makes it abundant. Energy, case in point. We talk about energy scarcity. But we live on a planet that is bathed in 5,000 times more energy than we consume as a species in a year. If you look at the numbers, the rate and the cost of solar is dropping through the floor as production rate is going through the roof. I was just uh, interviewing Elon Musk, who's the chairman of Solar Cities, and we were having a debate at the Goldman Sachs conference, and the prediction is that within 20 years, we'll be meeting over 50% of our energy needs from solar. That's extraordinary. That's his prediction and mine, and Ray's, and a lot of people in the field. It may not be the oil industry's prediction. And if you have abundant energy, we live in a world of abundant water. Two-thirds of our planet is covered with water. Yes, 97.5% is salt, 2% is ice, and a half a percent is the clean water we fight over. And yes, half of the disease burden on this planet is due to unclean drinking water. Solve that, and oh my God, what a transformation we have. But there's amazing technologies in the field of nanomaterials coming down the line, and of course, I hope you all know about my good friend Dean Kamen's extraordinary work with Slingshot, right? He has built a device here it's about the size of a dorm room refrigerator that has two hoses. One hose goes to anything wet, the latrine, arsenic-infected water, the Pacific Ocean. And out the, water comes, out the other hose comes water so pure it meets the medical standards for injectable water at two cents a liter. Coca-Cola has committed to mass manufacturing these and putting one in every village. These are the kind of changes that are non-linear, that are being driven by exponential technologies. This Maasai warrior on a cell phone has got better mobile comm than President Reagan did. I mean, extraordinary. And yet, you know, on a dollar or two a day. And if they're on a smartphone on Google, they've got access to more knowledge and information than President Clinton did. And guess what? On that phone, they've got two-way video teleconferencing and HD cameras and HD still cameras and GPS and things we would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars for just 20 years ago. The world's changing. The democratization of all of these things is changing at a rapid rate. You know, I was very proud in January 2012, almost two years ago, to be on stage with Paul Jacobs, the chairman and CEO of Qualcomm. Uh, he and then Don Jones at Qualcomm and I had worked with an amazing team to come up with something called the Qualcomm Tri-Quarter X Prize. Daniel uh, referred to this, and you'll be hearing about this more. Um, We've asked teams around the world through this X Prize. Qualcomm Foundation put up $20 million, 10 for the purse, 10 for the operations, to ask teams to come up with a handheld medical device that you can talk to. It's got Watson, it's got AI on the cloud. You can cough on it, you can do the RNA or DNA analysis, the pathogens in your sputum, you can do a micro blood prick in your blood chemistries. And in success, it will diagnose you in an initial 15 different medical syndromes better than a group of board-certified doctors. And when we announced this competition, we had 335 teams around the world enter and pre-register. You know, it's extraordinary what crowdsourcing solutions can do. We're down to the top 35, and we expect a winner in the next couple of years. So I'll end on these last uh, two slides. And for me, they're one of the most important slides of my deck. The first is that we've just crossed the 7 billion mark. Anybody concerned here about population explosion? Anybody? Okay, so a few hands go up. Let me, let me share the following. There are two things proven to reduce population growth rate, and only two things. They are making a populace healthier and better educated. 
And that's exactly where we're heading. Bill Gates has an amazing talk on this subject from Ted that, that I, I, I commend you to watch. So I went to Morocco where 30 years ago, the average was 7.8 children per family. A new king and queen came in and invested in the healthcare system and educational system, and it's dropped down to 2.8. Countries like the US, Japan, many countries in Europe are in negative decline. You want to reduce population growth rate? Don't make it illegal. Don't try and, and sterilize. You make a populace healthier and better educated. But that's not the point of this slide. The point of this slide is this one. In 2010, we had just shy of 2 billion people connected on the internet. 2 billion people. By 2020, six and a half years from now, we are going from 2 billion to 5 billion people connected on the internet, at least five. That's three billion new minds entering the global conversation. Three billion new thinkers. Three billion new problem solvers. Three billion new innovators. Three billion new consumers. What are they gonna desire? What are they gonna build? What are they gonna solve? What are they gonna want? Because as we're heading towards this world, believe me, the kid in Mumbai, the Maasai warrior with access to cloud computing, cloud printing, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, they're gonna start innovating at an extraordinary rate. We're gonna to start to see technology flowing from the developed world, from the developing world into the developed world. For me, this represents the greatest epic era of innovation ever. And I think a world that we're heading towards of healthcare abundance. Thank you.